Welcome to Research Tools Video 15. My name is Kurt Schwer, and in this video, this is Python Part 8, and I'll be talking about Matplotlib. And hopefully this is Part 1 of several uh, episodes of Matplotlib. Now I'd like to take you through some basics of general graphing and plotting in Python. Now my background is with GNU Plot, and while that's a great tool, I find it kind of limiting and frustrating in that it doesn't have a full programming language to go with it and it isn't quite as flexible as matplotlib. So you'll be following along with me as I learn some of the basics of matplotlib. So let's jump into it with some GPS data collected from the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping Joint Hydrographic Center from the roof of our building. We have an Airmar GPS and weather station. It's typically used on a ship mounted on our roof. So we'll go ahead and copy the data that I've pre-prepared. Now I've gone ahead and pre-parsed this so that we don't have to go through all the basics of NEMA parsing that we covered in previous videos. So for those, see videos 12, 13, 14. So we'll go ahead and make a directory for our video 15 class. So video 15, we'll use a dash P to do multiple directories. And we'll go ahead and CD into video 15. And we'll go ahead and wget that file. So use the mouse to paste that and hit enter with wget. We'll grab our data. And the first thing to notice is that we are not going to uncompress this file. We're going to be working with tools in IPython and PyLab. There's a tool called uh, load text in NumPy that actually knows how to read compressed data without uncompressing it on the disk first. So let's take a look at our data and see what we've got. We can do file 2011 tab. And that just tells us that we have some compressed data. We can do a bzcat 2011. And the first thing I would typically do is pipe that to less because if it's crazy binary data, less is pretty good at protecting us from screw having our terminal screwed up. So press return. And lo and behold, we have some data here. So we'll go ahead and use Q to quit out of less and we'll take a peek at that by using head instead. So we'll hit up arrow, go back and replace less with head. And in our file, a typical common convention is to use the pound or hash character on the first character of a line to indicate that this is a comment. Now I've used that here and I've written in some identifiers for the columns in our data. We're going to have X or longitude first, Y for latitude, Z for our altitude. With positive up, you have to watch out with marine data, sometimes positive is down, which is no fun. A quality factor and number of satellites and horizontal dilution of precision. We're going to ignore the latter three and just work today with X and Y. And I think we'll probably even ignore our altitude or Z. So that looks pretty good. We'll go ahead and start our IPython so we can start taking a peek at the data. So we'll say IPython dash dash PyLab and that will turn on the plotting mode. And this is a convenience option that imports all kinds of modules into the default, what's called it namespace. And that way we don't have to be typing numpy dot something or other or <clears throat> digging into scipy and matplotlib if we need to. So. Go ahead and start that up, and we'll do a PWD. So we'll see where we are. We're doing LLS to see what's in our, our directory. So it looks pretty good. And let's go ahead and try loading our data. And we're going to use a command called load txt. So we can do load txt question mark, press enter, and this will give us help. And we can read up on this function a little bit. Key things to notice in the file definition, this tells us where on disk it's grabbing this module from. And we can see that it's uh, this function load text came out of numpy lib and in the npyio. What we really care about is numpy. So later on when we write up this code as a file that we can reuse, we're going to have to import this numpy and get it back in because we won't be using the dash dash numpy with an actual module. It only applies to the IPython shell. So let's take a couple, peek at some of the options for a load text. We've got our file name, fname, 
Our type is going to be a float, which should work just fine for us. It defaults to having comments start with a pound. That's great. Delimiter none means white space. We'll see that below. And so it looks like our defaults are pretty close to good. So here the F name is showing us that if we have a .gz or .bz2 on our file, we don't have to worry about it. It'll take care of it for us. D type talks about the data type for what it's going to create in memory. Comments, delimiters, all looks pretty good. And in a little bit, we'll probably have to come back and take a look at unpack. So let's go ahead and hit Q to quit out of the pager. And let's load up some data. So data equals load txt. And then I'm going to do a single quote. And I'm going to start typing the file name, so 2011. And I can press tab to complete that. Remember that the tab completion tends to look at the context of where you are. And it tries its best to guess to see if there's an option you can just use. Press Enter. And our data should load in a second or two. And now we can ask it type data. Now our data is of type numpy nd array. We don't need to really know much about this other than it's a array or list-like object, but it's actually a, a very specialized and fast representation of data. It's a what's called a data structure, and it's designed to be speedy and work quite well with numerical processing. We can take a quick peek at it by starting off by saying length of data, see what we've got. And we have 86,000 lines. And let's check our file to see. So we'll use the bang to run a bash shell command inside of IPython. And so we'll say bzcat. Now tab didn't work for me because we're inside of uh, that. And we'll type 2011. Now did know how to complete the file name. And we want to pipe that to wc, which is word count. And if we give it the dash l, it's only going to count the number of lines. And so you can see here that we are, have just a difference of one in the length, and that comes from the comment line being counted with the word count, but not in the length of our data that we got. So let's take a look at one entry of our data. So we'll just say data sub zero. And what we've got is in the first entry of the array is a list, or actually another array. They work the same. And it contains one record from the GPS. So here we have our longitude, our latitude, our altitude, our quality factor, and our other two parameters. Not quite what we want. We actually want a, an array of our x's, an array of our y's, so we can plot them against each other. So we're going to, going to need to uh, load up the data a little bit differently. But before we do that, assuming that this data set is really big, if we load too much stuff into memory, we may end up going slow later on. So I'd like to show you how to get rid of something from your workspace. So we can say whose, and that'll tell us what's in our workspace. And we have our data here that we don't want to keep around anymore. So we can just say delete data, hit enter. And then if we type whose, there's uh, nothing left back in there. Now this when you call delete, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that, that memory has been freed up, but it lets Python at any point later on the road do what's called garbage collection and grab that memory back if it needs it. All right, so let's go ahead and look again at load txt with a question mark, and we'll get some help. And there's this unpack option, which sounds like it might do what we want. So we'll scoot down there, hit space to get down a page. And if we look at unpack, it actually does exactly what we want. It grabs out each of the the vertical columns of data into a separate variable. And Python has a style of writing variables where you can say several different variables equals and then something. And it will split apart each of those ver very nicely for us. So let's go ahead and try that. So we'll say x comma y comma z and then comma quality satellite and hdop equals load txt and then our file name. But now we're going to say an extra option and I'm going to make the terminal wider so we don't have to deal with wrapping which can be a little confusing. And we'll say unpack equals true. Hit enter and it loaded the data a little bit faster this time but because of uh, once you've loaded data through it tends to sit in a operating system cache so it works with it faster. But we can say type x. It's still an numpy uh, nd array, but we can say length 
x, also the same length, but if we say x sub 0, we get back just one x coordinate. If we just hit x and hit enter, we'll see that it is an array consisting of just our longitudes, and y is just an array of our latitudes. Now, being that there's over 80,000 points, we're not going to go look at that. So it's best to use Python to try and get a sense of what's in your data. So we can say average of x. So this will compute the average value. So x pretty, looks pretty good. Looks like that's right about the location of Seacomb. And for y, we have a nice 43.135. Now that is actually a point right on top of our building, right where the device is located. So that's excellent. Now we can also say what's the range of that. So we can say min x and max x, and that will tell us how much variation there is. Unfortunately, this isn't in a unit that we really care about. This is longitude, and you probably don't have a good sense of the difference of those two. So if we say max x minus min x, we have two thousandths of longitude, of a degree of longitude, and that number doesn't really mean too much to me, so later on we'll convert that to meters. But let's go ahead and plot our data and see what it looks like. So we'll plot x, and this is our first use of matplotlib. And here we have our x variable, and you can see this varying, it looks fairly random back and forth throughout the day. This is 24 hours of GPS data. And that gives us a sense that this is a fairly random process. There's not some sort of strange bias or pattern going on. And we can also try and plot our y data. And to make this a little bit simpler, I'm going to narrow this up. So plot y. And we get something that really isn't what we want. This is plotting our x down here and our y up here on the same graph, and that's really not what we want. So let's learn how to deal with stuff like that, where we can split it apart into two figures. So we can say CLA will wipe out what's in your particular figure. This is called clear axis. And let's go ahead and plot X again. So we've got that all set up. So we've got a nice figure there. And let's go ahead and plot our Y. But before we do that, and we're not gonna do that, we're gonna say figure two, and we're gonna create another figure. So it defaults to create starting off with figure one, and we can make a figure two. So let's skinny that up, move it over, and now we can say plot y. Press enter, and now we have our x and our y data, and we can look at them at the same time, assuming that you had a screen big enough to see them. So that's pretty nice, um, but what we really want to do is maybe we want to see them together plotted against each other. So we can say figure three, and we can say, move that out of the way, and we can say plot x comma y, so that plots our latitude and our longitude against each other. Remember that I tend to do everything x comma y, then that would be longitude comma latitude. So we'll hit enter, and we get what looks like an ink blot test. But this shows us that we have a pretty good sense of what the GPS wander is. It doesn't go heading off across the globe. And this is a lot better than we might see in uh, data from the 60s and 70s when satellite navigation was just beginning. GPS is actually pretty good these days. But if you're going to use something like this, you're really going to want to start being able to label it. So let's talk about labeling and setting up uh, figures so that you can then later on save them and put them in your notes. So let me make this a little smaller. And let's talk about labeling. So title is the probably the most common one. So GPS wander for one day. Not a great title, but it's good enough for now. So that puts a title up here at the top. We can label our X axes. So X label. And we can say longitude. And lo and behold, we have a nice little longitude hiding down there. And, whoops, we'll want to just start again fresh. So label, at Y label, and latitude. And so there we've got a latitude on the left, and this figure's a little small to be showing all the text, so we're not going to worry about that. Now, if you want to switch back and forth between all of your figures, you can just say figure one, and we'll go back to figure one. And then we can say title and I don't remember what was on figure one, I believe that was X, so we'll just say X, 
x axis axis press enter now if we go back here and we look for our figure one hiding in the back we have our x axis so that's pretty nice we've got some basic figure stuff going and we can clear that up and get rid of these guys because we just want to play with this one for a moment and we can add annotations right into the middle of the figure if that's helpful and I think here the the x average and the y average will actually give us a fairly good estimate of our station location and it'd be nice to see if they are right in the middle of this or if they're off to one side or the other so let's go ahead and put them up there so first we'll do an annotate to put text right there that says center so annotate and this is the text where it's going to be on our screen now this is a pretty flexible command and there's a lot you can do with it I'm just going to do the basics so x come x y equals and now this is a named argument and we'll talk more about those in the future but this way there, if there's a lot of arguments to a function you can just call it one by name and we'll say where our x and y are is going to be here so we'll say x average whoops we'll say average of x comma average of y now getting the number of parentheses is always a challenge here since we don't have a uh, magic flashing parentheses like you would have in Emacs so we have two here and that's one less so we're down to one and we need to match this guy over here on the, the right so we'll do that annotate and if you see a center appeared right over here so it's very nice and let's put a circle right next to it now you can control how data is plotted so the default was a blue line and let's go ahead and create a point that will plot with what we want we want a red circle so we'll say plot average of x comma average of y so that gives us a list of one and a list of one and then we'll say we want to do it with red and a circle now you'll have to look up the codes for all the different colors and shapes but I remember that R is for red and O is for and that's not zero that's O is for a circle so we'll hit enter and we now have a little red dot here in the middle so that's the very basics of plotting it works pretty well and let's talk a little bit about getting our data into something that means a little more to us than latitude and longitude and there's a tool called proj and it has a Python interface called PyProj and that will let us actually do great circle math and so if we have two points it will give us the distance in meters and the direction both two from point one to point two or point two to point one or it also has other functions to do projections and whatnot but we're just going to use something called GEOD that will um, let us do that great circle math so let's go ahead and import PyProj and we can say pi proj period geod and let's use a question mark to ask for some help we'll make this a little bit wider so we can actually read the text so we'll hit enter and it says right here performs forward and inverse geodetic or great circle computations the forward computation involves determining latitude longitude and back azimuth of a terminus point and we actually want the inverse so we can go ahead and try that out so we can first have to create a GEOD object which actually we have to tell it which ellipsoid we'd like to use and ellipsoids are not something that I go into too much in this class but they are basically the shape of the earth and there's a bunch of different approximations for the earth that people use we're going to use the same one as the GPS system so ellipse equals WGS84 press enter and so now we can say GEOD period press tab and we can see that there's a couple different functions on there we can also use the DIR command to list what's inside and we'll see a forward and an inverse so let's go ahead and type GEOD dot inverse question mark to see what it does and this actually calculates with a two pairs of lat long and lat so remember that's X and Y X and Y the distance and direction so actually it's going to give us the di two directions and a distance so let's go ahead and give it a shot and we have some data loaded so we'll just say geod dot inverse and we'll use our first and last points in our array so x0 y0 is the very first point 
And then we'll use the second point, or the very last point, which is y, uh, x minus 1. So that goes to the end of the array and goes back to the very last point, And y sub minus 1. And we're going to ignore this part in here because it defaults to giving us degrees, which is good enough for now. Press Enter. And we actually see that the, here's the direction in degrees. And here's the distance at 5.3 meters. That's not actually too bad. If you're trying to do real-time kinematic surveying with, uh, for hydrographic surveying, this is not good enough. But for just general use of knowing where you are, this is pretty good. So this is a nice tool that gets us some basic data, but we want to go through and do that for everything. So let's write ourselves a little Python module that will actually run through the whole thing and produce a list of data in uh, distance in meters from our average. So we'll open up Emacs. We'll go in, so control X, control F, and we'll go into video 15. So here we are in directory, and we'll open up a file called wander.py. And we'll start creating our Python script. But inside of any module, you don't get the imports that you had inside of IPython. So otherwise, it would be hard to write and manage code. So you want to make sure that everything is self-contained. So we need to import our PyProj. But we're also going to need to import that stuff from PyLab. Now, the main one that we need is called NumPy. So import NumPy or NumP. Now, oftentimes people make aliases, so they don't have to type as long a name for it. And there's a very common one for NumPy, and that's NP. So you say as NP, and now you only have to refer to it as NP. It's a little extra confusion if you're new to this, but it's what people tend to do. So I'm going to follow the normal convention. And let's start writing some code. So we're going to create a function. So def tells us that we're going to start a function. We're going to call it wander list. It's going to produce a list of points. And we need to pass it in a file name that it's going to read the points from. So file name, that's our one argument. Press enter, and Emacs has done the appropriate indent of four to say that we started our function. Remember that Python uses indentation to mark blocks. So first we need to make ourselves that GEOD object. So we can type history over here to see what we were doing. And we can look back through and say, oh, here's what we did. So we're going to copy that, edit copy, go back over to Emacs, control Y to yank or paste. And we've now created our object that we'll use to do our geodetic computations. We need to load the data. And so that loading of data was back up here. So we're going to grab number 13, edit copy, and paste. So now we've loaded up our data, and we need to start doing some calculations. So we're going to be using that average quite a bit, and it actually takes a little bit of time to compute an average. So it might actually be a good idea to just do it once. So xav equals x, uh, average of x, and y average equals average of y. Pretty unexciting. So now we have those saved. And what we want to do is build up an array of um, our distances. So we'll go ahead and say m for meters equals an empty list. So we're going to start off with an empty list and we're going to walk through our data and fill that out with lots of distances, one for each of our points. So we're going to say 4i in range length of x. So what we've done here is we've created a for loop and i will be the index into x, y, and z that we're going to use through that. Uh, OK, so now we've got our for loop. The colon started it. We pressed Enter, and py the Python mode in Emacs automatically indented another four spaces for us. So we're now in our new block with indentation. And we'll say distance equals, and we're going to abbreviate that dist, so geod dot inverse. We'll start off with our average, so x av comma y have, and then we'll take our points, our point that we're working on. So x sub i, we're working on the x, the ith x, and y sub i. Okie dokie. So now we've got that. That's that should calculate our. Um, actually, distance is not the right thing. This should be maybe. 
oops, hit tab there. I'm going to replace that with results. Now if we remember our results over here, when we did our inverse, we'll back up and do that, we got a, the direction, the, dis, the second direction going the opposite direction and from point B to point A, and then we got our distance. So we have to get, this is position 0 in the list, position 1, and position 2. So we need the second position, so we'll say m.append results sub 2. So we're going to take that distance value and append it onto our list of meters. That looks pretty good, and then we need to return that back from the function so that we can actually use that data. So this looks like a first draft of a function that might work, so control x, control s, saved. And let's go try it from IPython. So we can say import to bring in our module and wander, press enter. And so now we've loaded up our module and said so we can say dir wander and see what's inside of wander. And inside there we've got our wander list function. So we can say wander dot wander underscore list. And we need to then pass it a file name. If we look back here, we have a file name that needs to go in. Now I've noticed my first bug while looking at this that I've hard coded that file name by accident by pasting in. So I'm going to delete that text. I just hit the delete key or control D and we're going to put in file name and control X control S and rather than just go ahead and type that I'm going to hit control A to go to the beginning of the line put a comment in there we'll hold that off for now and we'll say now if we just did import wander we're still going to have that problem we need to do a reload to update the module wander inside of Python. Typically what it does is what's called caching, where it hangs onto that module and so if you call import a lot inside of your code, it only does it the first time it needs to, which is great when you're running in production mode and you're actually processing your data in the final part, but when you're doing development and trying things out, reload will actually ch bring in your changes that you've just made. So reload wander. We can say, go back up to our wander list attempt up here and we can now put in our file name so 2011 tab and our string and let's give it a go and now we want to try and save that to a variable so we can say m equals or actually we'll just say distances equals and we'll hit enter and we have some problems so let's go back here and we'll work through our bugs uh, the first one is load text uh, actually had to come from NumPy, so we'll say np.loadText. And we're going to also see that coming in from average, so np.average and np.average. So that looks pretty good. Hopefully we'll get it now. So we'll go um, control R to search back through, and we'll type RE, and we get back to reload. Press enter, so we've reloaded the module, and I'm just going to use up arrow twice there to get our old command. We'll try and rerun it again. It worked for a little bit and then it had troubles. And in here, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you what this error might mean. I believe it means that we have a point that is too close to our center average such that doing the calculation for distance doesn't really make sense. If two points are at the same location effectively in terms of the math, then there really is no sense of direction. So in that case, uh, it's going to go ahead and be upset and just tell us that things are trouble. And this brings up something we need to learn about with exceptions, and it's that when you get this uh, an error with what's called trace back here and that raised an exception, we can actually use that to our advantage. And Python hopes that when an exception is thrown, there'll be something in the calling tree of functions that knew how to handle that exception and get things back on track. In our case, we do. We can actually say that if we get this exception, we know the point's too close to the average and we'll just call the distance at zero. So that means we need to learn how to try to catch these exceptions. So let's do an example of trying this out. So when you use exceptions, you put a try around a bunch of code. So print hello. And I can actually cause an exception to happen at any time I'd like by just saying raise exception. This might be something you call with a particular kind of exception later on. 
Um, we hit enter, and if we say print never gets here, so when an exception happens, it'll skip any code until it gets to that exception block, it'll, so it'll jump right there. So we can say except print oops, and now we have an exception that that's been caught, and if you have problems, you can then push up something new and say things are bad, or you can get things back on track. So we'll hit enter and try that out. And so you can see that the try block came in here, called print for hello, the exception got called, so it jumped down here and ran the code that was supposed to handle that exception. So we can put that into our code. So we can go down here where we had the problem. We can say try colon. Now if we want to indent this another block in Python, we can do a control A here, control space to mark a block, and go down two lines. And we actually have in the Python module some helpers. So shift region right is control C greater than. So we can do that, control C, and then a greater than, shifted it right. That's always handy, so you don't have to worry about counting spaces. And then so I hit tab and then backspace to get it to the right spot. Type accept, colon, and now we can say m.append zero. So that's handled our exception. Things are back on track and we can keep working through the data. So let's save that, control X, control S, and let's go try our function again. So we'll go back up to reload, and then we'll run our distances, press enter, Wait, 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 and there we go. And so now we can say plot, wait, CLA, clear our graph, and plot distances. Press enter, let's see what we got. So we'll make this a little smaller. We'll hide our Emacs. And we have a nice little graph of distances. This is fantastic, so this gives us a sense of the variation from average throughout the day. We can also say average of distances. And we can see that our average distance away from the centroid is 2.8 meters. So that gives us a great sense of how good or bad this GPS is. So on this day, we typically knew where we were to within a couple meters. Pretty nice. But now let's finish up by taking a look at how to build figures that contain multiple plots so we can summarize all of what's going on. And that's done with something called subplots where you can make multiple figures. So we'll clear our figure three and we'll also make this a little smaller. So scoot that down. And we'll say CLA, our figure is empty. And now we can use the subplot command to go ahead and create a uh, multi layered plot. And the way that's done is with three numbers. So we'll say subplot 411. And what this means is we're going to have four individual plots in terms of going down. We're going to only have, that's the number of rows. We're going to have one column, so they'll run from all the way from the left to the right. And then we're going to start working on the first one. Now, since matplotlib is patterned af after MATLAB, and MATLAB counts from one with this stuff, we have to deal with a case where we don't actually count from zero, so I apologize. Let's go ahead and hit enter. If we look over here, we're now out working on the first of four figures, and so we can say plot x. That looks great. Now we can jump to the second one, so we'll go up to our subplot command and replace that last number with two, and now we can say plot y. That's nice. And then we can say plot, whoop, we need to go to subplot three, and we can do plot distance. Oops. Distance is plural. So that's got our distance graph in there. And now the last one we might want to do is a histogram plot of what those distances are like. So we can see sort of the distribution of how far away things are. And histograms are typically done with a command called hist, H-I-S-T. So we're going to go up to our subplot, 
and we'll go jump to number four. And I'm going to slide this up so we can see the histogram as we build it. And so you can say hist and then any list of uh, things. So we can first do a question mark to see what it'll do for us. And the key thing to note here is that histograms matter very much about how many bins you're going to use. It's going to start off with a default of 10, so let's give that a try. So we can say hist distances, press enter, and we see our histogram down here with only 10 bins. That doesn't tell us too much about our distribution. It might have some sort of various pattern down here. The average is right down here. So let's go ahead and tell it to have more bins. So distances, and we can say bins equals 30. And we'll see a new histogram drop right on top of that. So you can keep adding to any particular plot more figures as you go. Or we could do maybe 300 and see how that looks. That doesn't show too much very well. So maybe we want to do a uh, CLA. Hopefully that will just do that one axis. And that cleared out just that one subplot. And we can then run our histogram. And let's try about 100. So there's our final plot of how we did. And you can see the average is right around in here of our distance from our centroid of our GPS. And that's our first lesson on plotting with Matplotlib and Python. I hope you come back for more. And the, again, this has been uh, a lecture for the Research Tools course at the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. Thanks for joining.